next guest was born and raised in Kelowna, BC. She is a restaurateur, actor, producer, mother, and has recently added a new feather in her cap, director. She graduated from both Capilano University and the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. From there, she discovered her talent for producing. Two of her shorts, The Cave and Inconvenience, both earned critical acclaim at Berlin International Sundance and Toronto International Film Festivals. Most recently, she has turned a five plus year long labor of love into a stunning documentary called Maker of Monsters. It showcases the life of a late prolific Canadian artist, Bo Dick. So ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Natalie Bull. Welcome back everyone. Today we're at the beautiful Bauhaus in Gastown and uh, Natalie, thanks for uh, hosting us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Um, when did you decide to open Bauhaus? Uh, well, we opened Bauhaus three years ago. Uh, my husband was, I would say, an extreme foodie and he was coming from Germany and he used to come to Vancouver a lot for filming um, and lived primarily in Germany and when I met him he was moving to Vancouver full-time and he found that there wasn't any high-end German food and was really passionate about bringing German food to Vancouver so three years ago we decided to take the plunge and open up Bauhaus. It's a beautiful spot. Yeah, thank you. Definitely have to come back and check it out again. Yeah. When did you decide to make this documentary? Well, the documentary came um, in 2012. I, it was through my co-director, Leticia Fazakis. And Leticia was, she worked in the art community. She was a consultant at the time, working at a gallery. And she really felt that Bo would make a really interesting subject for a documentary. At the time, I was working on another documentary for APTN called Legacy with Helen Haig Brown. And Leticia had found out about that project and was like, hey, I have a, an idea for a documentary. I would really like to discuss it with you and um, show you the artwork behind Bo. And in 2012, I'd never met Bo before. I wasn't aware of his artwork. So she invited me to her house where she had a very um, large mask of Bo's. And she said, I want you to see his artwork before you make a decision. So I came into her house and immediately when I saw the mask, I had an emotional reaction and it was really intense and I'd never really felt that way encountering a piece of art before um, in the fact that it ha was like alive, it had a spirit to it and I just had shivers over my body and I said, yes, I'm doing this project with you. So from that, um, we decided to take a camera crew to Alert Bay shortly after that. It was March, 2012. And uh, we brought the camera crew to Alert Bay and really just started filming that first weekend I met Bo. And that interview actually became one of the threads in the documentary, one of the main interviews. And it was, yeah, a pretty intense experience. And from that, we filmed for the next five years. Five years, that's a yeah. long took. Wow. So you got a lot of footage in. We got a lot of footage. Our editor had a lot of stuff to go through. How did you find your team? Well, it was kind of a non-conventional approach to filmmaking because at the time there was a lot of funding restraints in the different funding agencies, so we didn't end up getting any grants. We didn't end up getting any broadcasters attached at that initial stage. So we really jumped into the project really non-conventionally. I had never worked on a project without um, a network or somebody kind of backing the project. So it became a huge collaboration and we didn't have funding to hire a director and we were both coming on as producers but life was happening and these events were happening that we really wanted to capture so we just dove in and kept filming and we were like one day we'll be able to hire a director and five years went by and we never really got funding um, to the level that we could hire an established crew so we realized that we directed it ourselves over the five years so it kind of gave you a little bit more freedom as well, I guess. Yeah, the, the restraints really became a blessing because we could film as long as we wanted, we could film whatever we wanted, and really let it naturally evolve as a project in itself. And the other beautiful thing that came out of it was that we had so many people come and support the project, and I think those layers of people really contributed to the final film. So we had like friends, family, other people in the film industry coming out as DPs, unit directors. So that collaboration, I think, really showcases throughout the film and allowed it to have kind of its own little 
spirit to it that wouldn't have if we didn't have that. Exactly. So what was the budget in total after it was all said and done? Well, the budget was really kind of piecemealed together because we didn't have one funding source. So um, in the beginning, it was really Letitia and I kind of funding it personally. And then in 2014, uh, executive producer Randall Perry came on. And Randall really brought the kind of sophistication that we were able to bring a higher quality production. So we were able to do it on the red camera instead of our iPhones. We were able to, or you know, smaller cameras, get a proper sound team in, and all of those things that we wouldn't have been able to shoot, like the aerials of Alert Bay, were all once Randall came in. And so the total budget over the five years um, was under $200,000. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. How long did editing take? The editing really was a big undertaking because we had five years of footage. Our, our editor, bless him, <laughs> had to go through a ton of footage. And also um, there was technical things like the sound wasn't right and all like we just kind of went for it. So we didn't always have a sound team and we didn't always have proper cameras. So we went to Finale here in Vancouver and Finale spent oh, I think almost two months on the project and they helped us color correct everything, bring things up to HD, they helped us um, really streamline the project so that it was cohesive mm -hmm. and bring the sound and everything to play and then we had some sound recordists also help us bring all the audio, restore the audio. So the post-production was a large portion of our funding went into post-production and also um, time. It, it took quite a long time. Wow. Yeah. What do you think you took away from the whole process and what did you learn from Kozik? Uh, well, the process, um, I learned a lot over the process. Uh, as a filmmaker, I learned to really let things organically come. I uh, Traditionally, I was used to, okay, this is your deadline. This is the objective of this project you have to get this 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 is the story we're going to tell and this is how much money you have to do it with this project very similar to Bo in his mentality we went with the flow so we didn't have any restraints we kind of went okay let's film this and then Bo would be here and we would go there and we just kind of went with it and really listened and we didn't have any restraints story-wise it was just really about Bo and what he was doing and who was in his life and we didn't have any time restraint. So the beautiful thing was, is when we started filming in 2012, he was in Alert Bay. He, um, his carving studio was underneath a beautiful bed and breakfast in a really remote area. And as the course of the filming, he became artist in residence at UBC, really shifted where he was in his life and what he was doing. And at the end, um, Last year, he was at Documenta, which is a huge international art exhibition, like one of the most prestigious in the world. So really, we were able to film this evolving of where he was. And um, if we had had funding and only were able to film for two years, we would have never gotten the extensive layers that we were able to. So it was a blessing in the end. Well, you really get to know somebody after five years, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, would you spend like weeks with them or days or like well they would work? kind of come and go um, sometimes we would spend you know a really intensive amount of time with him and then we would come back go through the footage and then we might we might not have filmed for a few months because it was over five years so we really kind of filmed as things were happening um, so that was really unique and personally I learned from Bo a very inspiring way to make change and I find that I'm a very political person, but I'm not really like, I don't really push it out there. And I find sometimes you're in a room and there's a lot of issues that come up and you can leave very depressed. And with Bo, I learned so much about Canadian history. I learned so much about what was happening, but more so than that, I learned how to acknowledge the stuff, but be inspired to make a change and not feel depressed about it, but feel encouraged that you're empowered with the knowledge and then therefore you can help make a change. And that is a huge lesson for me personally. And also one thing that I think that he has in company, 
One thing that I learned from Bo was his generosity and his inclusiveness. He really felt that you're sum of all of your parts and who you're with and who your ancestors are and you're not in that alone. You're, you're a part of a bigger picture. And I think that's something that we kind of lose. I find that a lot of people think of individuality, and, which is great, but sometimes you disconnect from your ancestors, you disconnect from your roots, and you disconnect from that. And from, from the time I spent with Bo, he was always surrounded with his community. If he won an award, there was an entourage of people that he brought to the table with him that he acknowledged were part of the process. And he was really a mentor that way. And um, that changed the way I view life and that changed the way I kind of live my daily mantras. Um, because you sit there and realize, yeah, I am part of a bigger, bigger picture. And I think as Canadians, uh, that is huge in learning about our history and making change and inspiring to make change. And I think that's one of the most important things that I took out of this project was really um, the knowledge and the, to inspire to make change. You mentioned he had a mentor. Uh, do you have any mentors, any advice from people along the way making this or in your career in general? Well, I think I have a, a few mentors. I think um, Bo was a creative mentor in the fact that he changed the way I look at my film career. So I've always wanted to direct, but I've always been really good at producing, so that's kind of where I fell in. And now this project encouraged me, encouraged me to be a director, so I have other projects now that it's inspired me to start, which I never would have normally done. Um, so in that process and also in life, just kind of going, you don't have to be part of something that you don't feel is right. You, you have the ability to make change. So personally, that was a mentor. And then also my husband as a filmmaker. So my husband has been a filmmaker for years. He's made over 30 movies. And he, he's a mentor for me in my, in my production process because he did a lot of the stuff himself. All of them, actually, he funded himself. And so business-wise and also um, politically, my husband has really helped mentor me through the process as well. You mentioned a few challenges, but what kind of challenges did you face um, in this project besides like, logistics? Oh, there was a lot of challenges. Um, oh, how to put all the challenges together. Uh, one of the challenge was the remoteness of Alert Bay. We really wanted to film Alert Bay and bring Alert Bay to the forefront of the project. Because I think if you, know, if you want to get to know Bo, you had to know where he came from. And it's really remote in a way. It's 12 hours away from Vancouver. It's quite expensive to get there on the ferries and to bring a team. So that was quite challenging. The other challenging thing was, besides the financing, which was a big challenge, um, was, I wouldn't say the continued filming over the five years, but, I think the challenge was to keep the spirit of the project going, not having really the money to do it. So we really got creative. Yeah. So I hate to say that it, it wasn't a negative challenge because in the end it worked out in a, a, as a blessing. But at the time we were going, ah, oh, geez, we really want to film this event. We have no cameras. We have no money. How are we going to do that? And in a way, I don't want to sound cheesy, the universe kind of provided and then somebody would walk in the door like Zach and he would be like, I have a camera and um, you know, I'll go film. And we're like, this is amazing. So we kind of had that happen where we would meet somebody and they would come on the project and Cliff, one of our DPs, had all the toys. So he came on the project and um, really the challenges were to kind of stop for a second and go, okay, we'll figure this out mm -hmm. and keep going. Exactly. It's like once you get the ball rolling, I find it's harder to stop than it is yes. to like keep yeah. going basically, Absolutely. right? And things will just happen and the universe or God, anybody will just step in and say, okay, this is what you're trying to do. Your heart's in the right place, your vision and your spirit. So these yeah. things come together, like you said, and, and work out. Yeah. Um, looking back, is there anything, anything that you would have done differently? 
I don't think there could have been anything differently because, mm -hmm. like I said, we didn't have kind of a structured outline like, oh, we want to film him here because this will help our story. Mm -hmm. We did it the opposite. We just kept filming. And then at the end, we had, we made the story in the end and the story really organically told itself. Obviously, I would have loved to have had proper camera and proper sound for everything that we filmed because there was a lot of beautiful footage we couldn't use. But we didn't and it worked out in the end. So I would have loved to have had more gear, but we didn't. So. Makes it more interesting anyway. Yeah, it's I think so. On, it's more of like a, a fly's perspective. Maybe, exactly. Or something like on a cell yeah. phone or something like that, right? And you can yeah. always correct it in the, in the post, right? So, yeah. Um, what are some traits, like having done a few projects now on your own and produced and now directed, what are some traits somebody needs, you think, uh, to produce or direct their own project or any project? I would say the biggest thing is patience. Mm -hmm. And I really learned patience from Helen Haig Brown, the director that I was working with on The Cave and Legacy. Okay. And she is a beautiful director and she really just let the process and the feeling come through. And before working with Helen, I was, okay, we need to film now, we need to film this, this is our deadline, this is how much money we have, and we only have this amount of time to use it. And I was very like abrupt, because I worked for networks and I was production managing and that's what you had to do. Then when I worked with Helen, she, we realized that that wasn't her style of filmmaking and I learned so so much from that. If I hadn't worked with her right before doing this project, I wouldn't have had that knowledge and patience. And what I would say to any filmmaker, especially directing and doing your own stuff, is you have to have patience. How do you juggle or cope with stress and juggle everyday life with work? And yeah. I think that that's something else I learned from my husband. We have three kids, so both of, we have two restaurants now three kids, we're both busy in the film industry. So there was a time when I used to bring my cell phone to bed. I'd work 16 to 18 hours a day and everything was about work, 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 work. And also I learned this from Bo is you really need to balance life and you hear this all the time, but um, my husband was very successful in his career and he had a rule, no cell phones in bed. And it was so hard for me, because I'm like, no, but I'm getting these important messages and I gotta keep going, 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 going. And so I stopped. And stop bringing the cell phone to bed was a really struggle, but I think that it creates that balance that your bedroom becomes like this... Um, sanctuary. Basically. Sanctuary, yeah. And so I think that was an important one. And I think also just giving yourself really scheduling and and making time for your family and really just unplugging and turning off. And for me, coming from this kind of workaholic production background, that was important because there was a time, and I never ever thought that this would happen to me, but there was a time opening the restaurants, doing the production, we were doing two of his films, the Rampage series. I literally almost had a breakdown, which I'd never had because I just thought you have endless energy and you can keep going. And that's when I really had to stop and say, you need nature, as cheesy as it is. Like, it's true. true. You really do need to spend time in nature. And you really do need to unplug from it all and take that time. And so now that I've incorporated that, almost like your daily, daily exercise, your daily na nature, eating healthy, all those things that you hear really change. And then I found that I was more productive in my business when I really took the time to acknowledge that that stuff was important and it's been a it's been a huge challenge but now i found that it um both creatively and family and just life it is really important i think everyone needs to take time and walk barefoot in the grass absolutely and recharge yeah and i think that we've kind of lost that like um, well, not everybody, but I think that we don't acknowledge that that's actually like a human thing that you need nature. And like you said, walk barefoot in the, in the earth, get dirty, spend your time. Like this morning, early in the morning, I just went 
to UBC and was like watching the ocean like that that is an, an energy that humans need I think and in that not to start a whole other conversation but that's where things like the Kinder Morgan pipeline and stuff come into play in the documentary because you really at some point you have to say that things are not renewable and that it's not sustainable the level of consumption we are doing on the planet like internationally we're just consuming way too much and nature is so important and we can't just jeopardize it for monetary advancements and that was really important to Bo and that was really important to us as well. Well who is Bo Dick and why should people go see this documentary? Ultimately I think Bo is a very inspiring person and I don't think you meet those type of people that often in your life. I would say it's almost like meeting the Dalai Lama. I, and until you see him, you won't understand that context. But I think that he had a knowledge beyond, and I think that he connected on a very spiritual level with so many people. And I just really find that in today's landscape with everything that's going on in the world, it's really important to meet somebody that inspires you. And Bo really inspired me. He really inspired Leticia. And I think there's an opportunity for him to inspire a lot of people. So that's why I think people should meet him. He's just a very interesting, inspiring person. And now it's playing uh, all over the theaters and across Canada and Cineplex? Yeah, so Cineplex has picked up a sponsored release and it's playing in 11 cities, 12 cities actually, across Canada on March 29th and April 1st. So two screenings in all the cities. Wow. Um, let's talk about distribution. How did you come across distribution? Well, distribution has been, um, was a little bit non-conventional in the fact that when we finished the film, we didn't have a broadcaster or any distribution in place. So um, it was really us at first uh, sending out two different um, film festivals and stuff like that really independently. But in 2012, I had met Cineplex. And Brad at Cineplex that I met, he worked with the special event stream. So he does like the Boy Show Ballet, Boy Show, I'll say that again. So I, in 2012, I met with Cineplex at AFM. And Brad, um, who I had met, worked in the special event stream. So he does the Boy Show Ballet, he does Phantom of the Opera, he does in the gallery series. So it was kind of a different stream than the regular blockbusters that go into Cineplex. And he took interest in the film and said, when you're done, I would be very interested because maybe we could show it as a special event. I didn't expect for the film to take five years. Um, so five years later, we kind of kept in contact and I thought, I don't know if he's still going to be interested. Um, and at that time, my husband introduced me to D Films, which is a Canadian distribution company. And they took it on, um, reconnected with Cineplex and they together partnered to help us do this release. Uh, the film touches on a few issues. Uh, you said Kinder Morgan. Is there any other um, issues that the, uh, it brings up or discusses? Well, yeah, I think that when we were filming, obviously, primarily, we wanted to film Bo, Bo's life and who he was and what he believed in. And during that process, and I think when you see his artwork, you find that it's very complex because Bo is very complex, his history is very complex, and I think that in order to show his life, you needed to show all of those layers. And um, so through that, we were introduced to a few issues in Canadian history, Indigenous rights, um, real Canadian history that we never learned before. And School so, system. Uh, yeah, stuff. and I think that there's a lot of things um, that we just didn't learn. And we've heard about residential school, but did you really, really know what that meant beyond just the word residential school? And um, indigenous rights. And I think that that Bo was a very inspiring person to say like, this is the stuff that happened in Canadian history. We need to, before we can reconcile this, we need to know the truth. So he was very much about telling the truth also, we came into contact with a lot of other issues. He's in Alert Bay. In that area, there was open-up fish farms. 
and it's a huge issue up there. Um, the fish stocks are in extreme decline. These fish farms are horrible for the natural um, salmon migration. And so when we were up there, you become so much more connected to the issues because the issues are so real once you're there. When you're in Vancouver, you're so disconnected. You're like, I can go to Safeway and get a salmon. And you disconnect from the severity of the situation. And you don't realize until you're up there and you see the fishing boats abandoned and you see the canneries abandoned and you see this long history of declining of fish and you see these open up fish farms and you see the, the waste coming out of these fish farms. Until you see that, you can't really put it all together. And so Alexandra Morton was um, a person that Bo felt was doing a lot of great work trying to challenge these fish farms and it's been really hard for her. So we filmed with her and he felt that she really needed a voice for what she was doing and really respected what she was doing. So we talk a little bit about the open net fish farming and Bo goes on a walk um, to break the copper and the legislation and during that walk he brings Alexandra Morton with him. And really, um, the, walk for re the walk that he did to the parliament buildings was really to challenge what was happening. A lot of things that were being said were being done by the Canadian government. And at that time, it was Harper. Mm -hmm. So we really thought that, is this going to be relevant? Because as we were filming, Trudeau came in. And we thought, oh, all this amazing stuff. Like, Trudeau is going to do all these changes. And then as we were filming, one of the last days filming, I was filming with Bo, and then Trudeau announces his support for the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Bo was so upset. Filming stopped, and he left, and he went down to protest. And that was one of the last times we filmed with him. Wow. And I think that um, it was just saying enough. Like, it's enough now. Like, we don't need to be doing this, and we need to make change, and we all need to kind of work together. And one thing that Bo did is he brought all the voices to the table. He didn't just listen to one voice, he listened to all sides and really made informed decisions and said, this is enough and we need to do something about it. And that was really, um, really important. And I think that the film Touching, Apart, Touching Those Issues was really um, showcasing the layers of Bo. When did Bo pass? Um, Bo passed away March 27th of last year 2017 so tomorrow will be a year since his passing wow yeah all right thank you so much natalie for having us yeah thank you really appreciate it thanks again everybody for watching uh the documentary is called uh, makers of monsters uh, the extraordinary life of bo dick uh and it's in theaters again on or in theaters sorry in march 29th uh, across canada links will be in the description below um please like share and subscribe thank you What's your story, Vancouver? Our city, our stories.